and welcome to week one of Murderer's Serial Mass Spree. Uh, as I was a little tardy in doing in the welcome video or the introduction video, my name is Dr. Stephen Bell. I'll be your professor for this class. And I just wanted to take some time to, uh, as I click over to my notes here, I wanted to, to take some time to go over some of the material that's going to be covered here in, in week one, which uh, coincides with, with chapter one of your textbook. Um, so as the title of the class suggests, and I think you know one of the reasons that a lot of you signed up for this class is that the serial killers and mass murderers and spree killers, the idea of, of these, these multiple murder offenders is just a, a fascinating concept in America, in the world uh, even. But specifically here in America, we, we talk about them. We, we have, uh, there's social media posts about it. There's uh, mass media discussions of it when it comes to the news or when it comes to entertainment value even. There are movies and, and television series that are made about you know, what we're gonna call, the, the term we're gonna use here are, are multicides. Offenders that, can, that commit multicide. And that, that term multicide is going to uh, encompass all three of those in the title of this class, mass murderers, spree killers, and, and serial killers. It comes from the root word multi, multi multiple, uh, multicide is, is where that comes from. And so it, it really just encompasses anybody who, who is killing uh, multiple people in, in a, and we're gonna define what the, the definition of, of an incident is because each of those types of killers has a different type of, of incident. Uh, definitions are, are important. Definitions are important, uh, but they're also fluid. And that's one of the, the challenges when it comes to defining uh, multi-side offenders. Take for instance, school shootings. Uh, there's a, a statistic that's been floating around the news uh, talking about uh, that there have been uh, a couple hundred school shootings already this year. And I know school shootings aren't, isn't in the title of this, uh, this class, but I'm using this as an example. A couple hundred school shootings occurred already this year. That, that's the, the statistic that, that's floating around in, in media right now. And so we need to look at the definition of a school shooting. Because when I think of school shooting, I think when a lot of society thinks of school shooting, we think of that one lone gunman walking in with a rifle or a pistol or multiple rifles or pistols into the classroom and shooting his classmates. I think that's your your typical, uh, typically what, what's envisioned there. Well, that statistic of a couple hundred school shootings actually encompasses other types of shootings as well. Uh, take, for instance, if you have high school students who are members of a criminal street gang and they're standing in front of the school and, and a rival street gang drives up that street and shoots at those other rival gang members and they're having to be standing in school property. That's a school shooting by definition. Is it what you thought of? I mean, it's not what I thought of until I started reading and digging into that definition. So that's why definition is so important. And we're not here to, to discuss, you know, it's not a gun control class. We're not here to discuss whether or not that should be a school shooting or shouldn't be a school shooting. It is, it's defined, you know, it, it's, it's within the parameters of school shooting. However, it's outside the parameters of what I think most of society thinks of when they think of school shooting. So let's talk about mass murderers, serial killers, and spree killers, and, and quickly dive into some of the, the definitional ideas there. I'm gonna let you read the textbook and do a little bit more research because there, there's some assignments that are that are due with that. But we're gonna we're gonna touch on this lecture. You can cite this lecture if you'd like in uh, in your assignments this week. But first, one we'll talk about is mass murderers. Mass murderers are what we're going to uh, define as uh, an offender who uh, commits multicide, multiple homicides at the same location at the same time. And the, again, definitions are important, but they're fluid. Some definitions, uh, some studies consider four or more being a, a mass murder uh, incident. Some say five, some say six. Whoever's doing the study can define it however they like. So I'm not going to hold you to a very narrow scope of the exact definition of numbers, but we're going to say multiple, several, uh, four usually being the, the smallest number used, uh, multiple or several homicides that occur at the same location at the same time. So picture uh, a good example of that would be the Aurora, Colorado uh, shooting in a, uh, a movie theater. There've been a couple of movie theater shootings. So if somebody walks into a movie theater and kills multiple you know, four or more uh, victims 
of uh, of this crime at the same time. They're all in the same movie theater, and the shooting occurs in a very short amount of time. That's going to be your your, your typical mass murder. Um, school shootings. We just talked about that. Could probably be uh, categorized as mass murders as, as long as it's not a prolonged incident. So if somebody walks into several classrooms at the same time uh, within a short period of time, and doesn't necessarily have a cooling off period. That's what's going to really be used uh, to to stipulate what a mass murder is, that, that lack of a cooling off period. You're just going from uh, one immediate location to another immediate location, whether it be inside a movie theater. So you can go to different theaters, you can go to uh, or to different screens in, in that theater or, uh, or different classrooms. Those would all be mass murders. Uh, moving on from that, let's talk about serial killers. Serial killers also commit multicide. They're killing multiple individuals. The number, you know, we'll call it several. Uh, the number, like I said, is fluid. But the difference between a mass murderer and a, a serial killer is that cooling off period. The idea that you've got uh, folks like Jeffrey Dahmer, who over several years committed several homicides, but it wasn't all at once. They weren't killing three, four, five, six, seven people at the same time. It was killing one, cooling off, thinking about it, sometimes having, sometimes having remorse. And then go, moving on to another uh, another subject, another victim of crime. Could be weeks, months, in between. That cooling off period is what really differentiates a, a mass murderer from a, from a serial killer. And then finally, the, the spree killers are much like a, a hybrid between the two. The, the offense does not happen at the same location, so we can't consider it necessarily a mass murder. There are multiple homicides, multicide. Is, is committed, but it occurs at multiple locations. So think of the most stereotypical uh, it is a uh, somebody who kind of goes off on a, uh, a mental illness crisis and say kills their parents at one location and then drives and then kills their wife at another location and then maybe goes to work and kills a couple people there. So you've got three different locations. We've got driving time between those locations but we don't necessarily have a full cooling off period. We have multiple locations with no real cooling off period because it's all a fluid situation. And that's what we're gonna define as a spree killer. So mass murderers, serial killers, and spree killers, those are your, your uh, again, fluid definitions. Uh, looking historically, I wanna kind of touch on and, and at least we, we can't have a class like this and not mention the, the very first identified serial killer in history, which was in Germany, uh, Peter Kurt, Kurten. Uh, Peter Kurten is, uh, was, was back in the early 1900s. We're talking about uh, between the years of 1913 and 1929 is when, when it's been identified that, that he committed most of his uh, serial killings, his multicides. Uh, he, had, he was called the, I mean, this is a bad guy. I mean, this guy, uh, there's a reason why he was the first to be identified as, as a serial killer there. Uh, not just in Germany, but uh, but in history, uh, they called him things like the monster of Dusseldorf or the vampire of Dusseldorf. Uh, when it came time for him to be uh, eventually convicted, he was finally convicted of nine murders, uh, seven attempted murders, and several sexual assaults. I mean, just just a real, I mean, monster of Dusseldorf, just a real monster. Uh, eventually, he was convicted, as I said, and sentenced to death, and he was killed by the guillotine. In, in the early uh, 1930s, 1931, I believe. So that that's got, we've got to at least identify and, and discuss the very first serial killer if we're gonna have a class like this. But let's talk about what causes or really what, what's the basis? What, what, where does serial killing and multicide come from? Specifically multicide, not, not specifically serial killing, but multicide. Is it, is it a brain malfunction? Is there something wrong with the brain of those who commit multicide? Or is there something wrong with the environment? We talk about this in intro, we talk about this in criminology. You know, what, what creates criminality? Is it environment or is it biological? And we, we've had long discussions about that in, in intro class, if you had that with me. And uh, same thing with if, if you've taken criminology with me. The idea that the criminologists for years have been trying to decide is criminality-wise environment or biological nature or nurture. Uh, and no different when it comes to multicides. Uh, take Curtin, for instance. You know, once he died, they did a brain scan, and he had no 
obvious anomalies in his brain. There was nothing, there was no brain damage. There's no uh, obvious physical uh, deformations of the brain. So there wasn't really an, an, an obvious uh, natural or biological rationale for him to, to commit the multicides. Uh, there's, there's also, when it comes to uh, environment, there are there's more than just uh, being raised in a in a bad home or or being abused when somebody is a kid. Um, look at the BTK killer, Dennis Rader. Dennis Rader, when he was finally interviewed, he talked about the idea that he worked at the Cessna company or for the Cessna company, and he at one point got laid off, and that was the kicking off point of him starting his criminality, his multisites. He ended up killing several people as a as a serial killer. And he was able to trace it all the way back to when he lost his job. I mean, there's a, uh, studies have shown there is a, a true attachment, specifically for males. And for, for men who are raised in environments where uh, you, these traditional gender roles are very, very important. That a man goes out and earns the money and uh, the, the female in that relationship stays at home and, and either takes care of the home or raises the kids. And the, these men are raised where their job is their identity. The ability to care for the family is their identity. When they lose that, they lose a piece of that identity, which can then spiral in, in maybe affect mental health, uh, maybe uh, you know, aid in the path towards criminality. Obviously not anybody that loses their job or is laid off is going to commit uh, multicide. It happens all the time that people are laid off or lose their job and they don't kill several people. But there have been studies that show that that specific portion of, of one's environment can play a factor. Uh, biologically, there, there's more than just brain, brain anomalies. There, there is mental illness. Mental illness plays a, obviously plays a role when it comes to, to homicide in general. Uh, paraphilia is, is mentioned in your book. I'm pointing behind my camera here. You can't see that, but I'm pointing behind my camera here at, at the textbook I'm sitting on the desk. And paraphilia, paraphilia is a mental condition that creates a... Uh, like a desire for dangerous uh, conditions, whether it be violence or dangerous sexual behavior, things like that. And so that is a commonality among many, many offenders when it comes to multicides. Uh, other mental health issues can be sociopathy or psychopathy. You know, the idea that folks are just born with uh, mental health conditions that just adversely affect their ability to avoid criminality, in this case, uh, avoid uh, multicide. So we, we look at that and we say, well, is it a brain condition? Is it a mental health condition? Or is it environment? Because we talked about losing a job, but obviously uh, you know, being raised in a, an environment where violence is uh, accepted or encouraged can, can play a role in encouraging criminality when it's older and then you know, criminality can lead to, to multicide. So which, which is it? And if you look at study after study, that, there, that argument goes back and forth and back and forth. But if you also look at more recently, uh, Dr. Deborah Nyhoff, she is a criminologist, and she looked at the idea that perhaps it, it, we don't have to choose one or the other. Perhaps it's the idea that both play a role. Again, we, we've talked about this, this concept in intro class, and it's also a, a criminology concept, the idea that, that some, some mental health crises can be triggered by environment. So you can have something that has a trigger for, or it has, is more prone to criminality, but unless they're exposed to a certain trigger, that criminality will, will never manifest. Uh, it, essentially what she was saying, uh, Dr. Nyhoff was saying, is that, that the environment can exacerbate that brain condition that already exists. Uh, one of the, a good example of that in, in, in a non multicide example would be the idea of addiction. Addiction has been shown to be genetic. There are genetic predispositions to addiction, whether it be gambling addictions or uh, narcotics addictions, alcoholism, things like that. However, regardless of whatever the genetic markers that exist in a person are, if one is never exposed to narcotics or to alcohol, they will never be addicted to it. They could be as predisposed as they want, but that trigger is the exposure to that chemical. Uh, another example of that is there, uh, there was a study that, that showed a genetic defect. 
there's a genetic marker that a very specific gene that causes somebody to be more prone to criminality once they're an adult. However, that gene is never triggered unless that person is exposed to starvation as a child or as an adolescent. These, uh, this specific gene that says, hey, you are more prone to committing crime. If you're never exposed to starvation as a child or as an adolescent, then that gene will never trigger and never cause that, that uh, prone to criminality uh, result. So you can have that, you, people can have that genetic marker all they want. And if they were never exposed to starvation as an adolescent or a child, it'll never trigger, never, never, never happen. Or you could be exposed to starvation as a child and an adolescent. If you don't have that specific gene, it doesn't matter. You still won't be prone to criminality for that, uh, for that specific reason. So both of those have to exist. The gene has to exist and that starvation trigger has to exist in order for them to to eventually be more prone to criminality. So that, that hybrid idea that Dr. Nyhoff was talking about, it, it, essentially it flips a switch. You already have that mental condition, but the environment, whether it be exposure to violence or losing your job, can be a, a genetic driver to that violence. Um, that, that's about all I wanted to talk about today uh, as far as uh, content. Uh, let me just remind you that we have uh, two assignments due this week. Uh, the first one is a discussion board post. Uh, that's going to decide. That's going to discuss why is society so infatuated, so fascinated with serial killers? And you don't have to dwell on just uh, serial killers. You can talk about spree killers or mass murderers if you'd like. So just essentially discussing multi-site offenders. This specific week, no references are required. Your initial post is due Wednesday at 11:59 p.m. So make sure that you address the prompt by Wednesday. Your responses, you need to respond to two of your classmates by Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Your initial response needs to be at least 250 words, and your responses need to be at least 100 words each. So this week only is just going to be opinion-based. Moving forward, we will have uh, more research in the discussion board posts. Secondarily, we have a PowerPoint due this week. It has a minimum of four slides and 50 words per slide. Again, just like the remind the welcome, not the reminder, the welcome uh, video said, those four content slides are just the content slides. You still need a title slide. You still need a reference slide. Uh, you're going to discuss the differences between spree, mass, and serial killers. Uh, you can break it up however you'd like. You can uh, you you decide how you're going to fill those four slides. Uh, you can do one slide per type and have a summary slide, it's up to you, but each slide has to have some creativity, bullet points on the slide and some graphics. And the each one of these slides needs to have a uh, notes section with 50 words in it. You don't need to have notes in your title slide or your reference slide, those are, those are standalone. Uh, again, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to take some uh, information in about multi-site offenders and, and week one. I look forward to reading your discussion board posts and taking a look at your, your power rankings. If you have any questions, make sure that you reach out. You have my contact information in the syllabus and we will chat again soon.